also going to record myself. So today we're going to look at, arguably, the most popular chapters of the parables in the Bible. So it's Luke 15. Parables are simple stories that Jesus used to illustrate poignant moral and spiritual lessons. There are three parables here. You probably know them. The, the headings of the most of the Bibles, not all of the Bibles, but most of the Bibles attached are the parable of the lost sheep, the parable of the lost coin, and the parable of the lost or the prodigal son. And when those headings are used, our minds are often focused on lostness. Right? That's actually the word that they use. So, of course, this is about lostness. And so it is, in fact, tempting to preach these stories by their negative features instead of their positive ones. But that's really not what the Bible says. It's not what the Bible teaches. The, the Bible focuses on the positive attributes precisely because Jesus focuses on the found sheep, the found coin, and the loving father. As we examine these three parables, notice that they all end in joy and celebration. And they end in like these extravagant parties that are going to rival New Year's Eve, uh, dropping of the ball, dun, 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 right? Times Square. That's the kind of party that the parables are talking about. These parables are about love and forgiveness and joy. It's not that, like, consistent clap at a decent concert. You know the one. Maybe. <laughs> right? You know that one. At least you guys are still awake. Uh, it, or the plastered uh, smile on family photos. I'm about to get married. I know my fiance has one of these. It's like, I'm so glad I'm here. We've taken 500 pictures. Can we stop, please? And uh, no, this is the standing ovation after Hamilton. Or perhaps it is the elation with your grandchild after their leading role in the community play, right? You are just so proud. You are just so excited. You know that, that per your kid, is, she is fantastic, and the world needs to know. It is the hooping and the hollering, the stupid, happy smiles, and the contagious, unbridled exhilaration of the Cubs winning the World Series in Series Game 7. Anybody remember that game? Yes, right? We were all like, <gasps> Oh, <gasps> ah! at least I was like that. I don't know about you. Um, but that is the kind of joy and celebration and merriment. You get me? Yeah? You may not all be jump out of your seats, drop your microphones, people, but you should probably shouldn't even imagine your like, great uncle, whoever, whoever, or that like neighbor girl across the street. That like, oh yeah, that's totally their jam. Um, but these fun stories include joy and celebration uh, above and beyond any of that. That's kind of cool, right? It's contagious. It is the kind of joy and celebration that ins are inspired by the found sheep and the found coin and the loving father of two confused sons. The story triptych are all popular in Christian tradition and art. I have often seen them in church uh, windows, stained glass. Some of ours here have these wonderful geometrical areas, which I love. But sometimes, if you think back, sometimes they had like stained glass with stories. These were some of those stories. Uh, part of my preacher and uh, is able the ability to convey the context matters, and that's even true in Jesus's parables. And so this is absolutely true uh, for the sermon of triptych today. So Luke 15, 1 through 2, I'm going to read some of these in the NIV because that's what I wrote them up. But when I do a longer reading of the parable of the compassionate father, uh, we'll read it from your pew Bible. Is that okay? Great. Okay, so Luke 15, 1 through 2. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. 
But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. And Jesus told these three parables in defense of his involvement with the lost. Ironically, the original audience included plenty of people that had the perception that they were never the lost one. Right? I, they, they've been lost. I've always been found. Like, that's the energy that a lot of these people are bringing to this. It, it was these folks who were admired for their piety and their theology, and they're the ones that are grumbling that Jesus is spending his time and his reputation on the deplorables of society. But this entire section of Luke, chapters 14 through 17, Focus as, as a gospel, as the good news for the outcasts. Well, at the same time, it, it, they also challenge that the never lost uh, also should be joining in on the celebration. This is a party. Don't be all like, I better than you all standing outside. Join in on the party. Don't slow clap. Give a standing ovation. Let your merriment explode to degree of the degree that your wiring allows you to, right? Like, not all of you are going to be the people who are, like, jumping up and down. I get that. Some of you just like the twinkle in your eye. That's what your merriment is in that. And that's okay. God created us all different. Just let the twinkle, if the twinkle is how you express merriment, be, like, very twinkly, okay? Yeah? Great. Come, let that be twinkly or explode. So let us turn our attention to the three parables and not get distracted with the Pharisees. Uh, Just to keep you on your toes and to mix it up a bit, I am about to start with the parable of the found coin. About seven years ago, I sat on my boyfriend's car and we went on a walk down Lake Michigan Beach. Ultimately, the outcome of this conversation was the termination of our relationship. Uh, Which, now that I'm engaged to a man who's a much better fit, no longer makes me as sad as it did then. But let me tell you, I was sad. In addition to the breakup, the outcome was that my wallet slipped out of my pocket. Like, oh, right? (laughs) No, could it be? So in the midst of literally crying on Pastor Ann's shoulders, because she is a magnificent friend, as you know, she's a magnificent pastor, but as a person, she's also a magnificent friend. Uh, in the midst of these sobs, with her hand, my head on her shoulder, being like, ah, I figured out that I had also lost my wallet. Can you imagine this, like, uh, feel? That's the one I had. And so I turned my car upside down, right? Like, I, like, pulled everything out, moved the seeds, did all the things. I I drove back to the beach and paced up and down the path. Uh, I went down by the boulders and through the weeds, searching between rocks and, like, the trash. Like, I was like, I need to find this wallet. And then I brought myself to call my now ex-boyfriend of three hours, and ask him to look through his car. Surprised he answered, but there he was. Uh, I'm going to tell you right now that that was not fun. I know, it's shocking. Uh, and then I called my mom in tears for both the lost wallet and the lost boyfriend, and I searched and searched and searched for days. But when all hope seemed lost, right, like I had given up, I was now like applying to get a new driver's license, all that. Uh, At that very moment, the moment before I sent in the paperwork to get a replacement driver's license, I got this phone call from my college administration admissions office. Some stranger had found my wallet, saw my college ID, and dropped my precious item off at North Park University, uh, which is our covenant denominational school. When they called me, I ran to the admissions office to get that wallet. I called my mom. I called Pastor Ann. I jumped up and down. You know, I was like, whatever, we broke up. Yeah, I found my wallet. And it turns out a bunch of people were already coming over to Pastor Ann in my apartment because she was, you know, a very gracious and loving friend, thinking that they were going to come and comfort me with ice cream. But instead, I turned it into a party. Rejoice with me, you all, about the wallet. And not so much about the breakup, but about the wallet. It has been found. 
I'm sure one of two of you have lost your keys or your wallet or your cell phone, and you turned your house upside down looking for it. The woman in this parable, she does that exact thing. Like, that's the energy she is bringing in. So in the NIV, uh, Luke 15, 8 through 10 says, suppose a woman, if I will invite my lovely volunteer over here as a my woman, suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Do you have 10 silver coins on you right now? Oh, I guess we're going to have to use a different sermon uh, illustration then. Uh, perhaps a woman has an iPod and she has lost it. Uh, doesn't she light a lamp and sweep around the house? Here, here's the house. Doesn't she sweep around the house uh, and search carefully until she finds it? I wonder where she could find the lost iPod. <gasps> wow! Hey, I have a line for you. I'm just going to have you read it. It was not on plan, but... Uh, Perhaps uh, when she lights a lamp, sweeps around the house, searches carefully until she finds it, and when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me! I have found my lost iPod. I mean my lost coin. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're good. <laughs> Give her a clap. Jimmy, do you all... Do you Rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. Jesus says in the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Unlike the other two parables uh, that in this triptych, the found coin makes no reference to repentance. This one focuses solely on the passionate actions of the woman and her joy in finding the coin. No one's like, why did the iPod get it, grow legs and move away? No, no, that wasn't it. It was like, we found it! A coin that was a day's salary, a, a full pull, piggy bank set aside to save for vacation. Or it's like the tween who has been saving her odd job money for months to buy a valuable item. Unlike in the next two parables, we often uh, think, where we often think in terms of the roles of the sheep or the son, this parable sheerly focuses on God and on God's attitude towards the lost and his pure excitement in finding. This parable, the lost coin or the lost iPod, whatever you want to remember, is all about the character of God that he is a searching God, that he is a seeking God, that he is a loving God. He is a God who likes to party, and, and he's a God that always invites others to join in on the celebration. Second, the parable of the found sheep. So we're going to read from Luke 15, 4 through 7. If you have your Bibles, you can turn them to there. Luke 15, 4 through 7. I love that Luke, so the author, uh, and Jesus, my proxy, Jesus, makes a clear effort to be gender inclusive. In much of the gospel book, there will be a female lead, and then there'll be a male lead, and, or a male lead, and then a female lead. It, it, it's a radical counter to the culture of first century society. So, so Luke strategically underscores the role of women thus making it aware of Jesus' relationship to both the female and male genders, but not at the expense of the others. It's not like it's all men. It's not like it's all women. It's like, hey, both of you are in the, the kingdom of God. You are both working. You are both joyously giving of your time, talents, and treasures for the kingdom of God. Um, Jesus is like saying, yeah, we're all capable to have leading roles in the kingdom of God. Yeah, is that good news? You get a leading role, and you get a leading role, and you get a leading role. We all get leading roles. 
Uh, thus, out of equitability, the parable of the found sheep has a male leading role. Luke 15, 4 through 7. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it back on his shoulders and goes home. And then he calls his friends and his neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents, over the 99 righteous people who do not need to repent. Many people here get theologically stuck in those 99 sheep. And so here are a few of the theological interpretations that people have found reasonable, found sound. We are uh, covenanters, right? So we are people who read and discuss the word. We are people who uh, integrate that into our lives as we read scripture. It means that we might not all come, we can come to faithful conclusions and then talk about them. So here are four faithful, well thought out, well theologically sound, and ones that people throughout Christian tradition have held. Maybe you hold one more than the other. First, that Jesus was telling people, the people who thought they were never lost, that God gives preferential treatment to the lost. These interpretations make a point that this is a harsh word to the audience who is complaining about Jesus eating with sinners and spending time with tax collectors. Jesus made his point with even, shar- even sharper to the Pharisees and the scribes when he closes this parable. There will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 persons who do not need to repent. In other words, there is more joy in heaven for one of these sinners that I'm eating with who repents than there is joy for you who are delusional by claiming that you've never been lost. So that's one interpretation. (laughs) Uh, I understand how people get there. I don't think that this is the most faithful uh, to the message of the text, but that might be you. I don't know. That is a very legitimate how people have interpreted over the years. A second common interpretation is grounded in the Ezekiel 34 text, which is our scripture reading for today. God being portrayed as the shepherd who gently and se- gent- sleekly and gently restores the lost. Yet his love is so strong that he leaves the other 99, and we should assume that the typical shepherding practices would be in place. This shepherd would have left the 99 sheep in the hands of co-worker or safe shelter in the fold, right? Anne didn't just, like, take off and be like, bye, y'all. She was like, hey, I'm going to give you off to a people I trust, and I'm going to go over there, right? Like, th- that kind of tending, too, is happening, if the other 99 are safe and, are, uh, and then searching for the lost sh- sheep is an exercise in common sense. In the Greek text, you will see this more clearly because verse 4 asks a question that has an expected response. Rhetorically, who of you would not leave? Contextually, it is clear that for the original hearers, all would have answered, uh, no one, of course. What fiscally irresponsible stewardship of an act of investment. This sheep is worth a lot of money. Why are we just going to let it wander off without, like, at least trying, right? This is what Jesus is potentially saying. Of course, the shepherd would leave the 99 sheep who are in good hands and find the one who has wandered off. It is foolish to not act when there is a possible gain with no possible loss. What do we have to lose? It is a question we need to ask when it comes to sharing the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ to other people, which is what intentional evangelism is. I happen to be bent in that way, and so lucky you, you get to hear about it. Uh, I talk about sharing our testimony. What do we have to lose? There is no loss that could counter the joy of another person falling in love with Jesus. Church, what do we have to lose? is part of our evangelical covenant denomination's ethos of highlighting outreach. Now, I'm not a part of your church, so I do not know how you define outreach, but I'm going to take a point of privilege and give you uh, some discerned definitions that the churches I have pastored have come to. So outreach for us, and maybe this will inspire something in you guys, or be like, yeah, we totally are on the same thing, or like, Pastor Julie, you are crazy. Any of those responses may be accurate. 
Outreach, the ones I have worked with, is one, evangelism. So sharing our personal stories of Jesus, being a part of our lives with those who God has put in our path. Two, compassion, mercy, and justice. So direct and systemic ways to help right the world in the kingdom manner. And three, church growth, inviting people into this loving family. I need you to hear that this outreach thing is, in fact, a learned skill. Sharing my love for Jesus as good news always makes my ears itch a little bit. I'm like, oh, but really? Um, I did this in a contextually appropriate way with my neighbors recently, and it was so incredibly vulnerable, and I wrestled with these feelings of being stupid for having even brought it up. I didn't want to appear to be one, the one like that was like shoving Jesus down people's throats or seeming like I'm backing people I care about into the corner. Does anybody else feel like that when you think about evangelism? Like, ugh, I don't want to be like. And that's real, and we should just name it. But what I try to remember for myself, and I, I hopefully this is helpful for you, it's been helpful from other congregations, what I try to remember is th that it is appropriate and natural to be excited about a movie and then tell your friends that they should watch it too, right? Like, if you think of your favorite movie and you're in a group of a setting of people you care about and, like, something gets brought up and you're like, hey, have you seen this movie or this TV show? You show, should watch it. It's, it's fantastic. Has any of you ever felt like this? or like a good book, where you're like, yeah, maybe they're not going to love it, but like, I love it, and I know that it's so good that I at least want to let them know it's on the table. Some of them may take it, watch it, read it, whatever, but many of them won't, and that's okay too. But are you, I don't think I'm being insensitive to be like, what? You haven't seen Cool Runnings? You need to watch it with me soon. It's so great. And if we can think of evangelism in that framework, it will take so much pressure off and probably entice us to share the good news with people more often. Does that make sense? Some like yeses, noes, should I explain further my analogy? Blank looks, okay, okay, I'm gonna take, oh, there's a smile. Great, y'all understand, fantastic. Go tell somebody about your favorite movie and then be like, also I love Jesus, P.S., okay. Uh, <laughs> so we'll back to the text. Along with the story of the Good Samaritan, this third parable is one of the most beloved, well-known, and influential parables of all of the uh, scripture, perhaps to the point where that many of us have been almost desensitized to his power. How the parable makes the radical assertion that celebration is the just response to repentance not shame. When you or someone else admits to wrongdoing, whether it was purposeful or not, we are healthier people if we can be people who generally are working to be able to give a hug instead of uh, saying, I told you so. Admittedly, this can be super difficult, right? Like, it is so much easier to be like, I told you so. Like, yeah, you finally figured it out. I told you the whole time, so, right? That, uh, that's actually very much easier, at least for me, than to be like, repentance brings celebration. Repentance brings celebration. Yay, you figured it out. Let me work beside you. Like, those are really hard. Uh, um, but this is what the third parable has has us. It is what the Bible calls us to. It is what being a Christ follower is expected of us. I told you so with a pointed finger is the opposite of celebration to the response of repentance. This third parable has been depicted by a host of artists, most notably Rembrandt's paintings. You don't have a screen, so I will invite you, if you have smartphones after the thing, I can pull it up for you. Uh, we can say the return of the prodigal son on your phones. Uh, if you're one of these people who just wants a phone break, this is a moment you could like, look, I'm looking up uh, Rembrandt's paint on the return of the prodigal son. Okay, you're not those people, but there you go. That's, uh, that's, it's there. Uh, it has been the subject of plays, even Shakespeare used it. It has been set to music and has been made the subject of many movies. The story of the parable of the prodigal son is most likely 
of the today's triptych parables to focus on the pain of lostness instead of the celebration of foundness. Here's a slight tangent that you can listen to me while you look up this painting, but you do you. Um, one, this is one of our denominations challenges to covenant pastors. I, if we're going to include and preach on these parables, we're supposed to connect these dots for the congregation. That they're not just ethereal out there, but this is like there's tangible ways we as a denomination and we as faithful followers of Jesus are living this out. In my ethics class, we examined the brokenness of a justice system. Because in the United States, it is punitive instead of restorative. It is, I told you so, instead of, come, you've repented. When people get out of prison and are having a hard time finding homes, when they cannot vote and cannot serve on juries, and often are ostracized by society, we have missed the point that celebration is the just response to repentance. I know that if Jesus were to address those coming out of the correctional facilities, he would lavish his great love. Celebration, not shame, is God's response to repentance. And thus, the Lord would expect churches to throw a big party, celebrate, and then advocate for them to find employment and for housing. As a denomination, the Evangelical Covenant Church has launched a restorative arts master's program that now allows free and incarcerated students to study together. Relatively recently, the dean of faculty and the professor of theological ethics, Dr. Clifton Strodersom, and Reverend Dominique Gilliard, who is the denomination's director of racial righteousness and reconciliation, well, they both asked for prayers as eight incarcerated students were up for clemency hearings. They reported that these hearings went well and now that the waiting period is on. I am proud, and I hope you too are also proud, of these leaders who have met, had uh, real uh, effects to have real change to the justice system, moving it from punitive to restorative. You may have read Reverend Gilliard's first book, Rethinking Re Incarceration. It helped form my theological response of how Jesus promoted celebration as the just response to repentance. Again, I don't know you very well, but my hope for all of us would be that we embrace these great movements in our covenant identity. An idea that might be in the future for you and it has been for my church in the past would be for, to read our director's recently released book, Subversive Whiteness, Scripture's Call to Leverage Privilege. There are some ideas you can be like, whoa, what did she say? Uh, at a different point, maybe it'll sink in. There are some um, on your handout, resources for exploration. You know, it's just good to know that there are things out there. Okay, we're going to go back to the text. Because scripture itself is powerful, and we believe that the Holy Spirit touches us in unique ways, I'm going to read the entire parable to you. And if you have your Bibles, this is the time to remember how to open them. Uh, Luke 15, 11 through 32. Uh, if you are newer to the faith tradition or reading the Bible. It is uh, the second uh, book in the New Testament, which is about two-thirds of the way through the, the Bible, starting in verse 11. Uh, I'm going to ask you to notice which role you put yourself in as I read the parable. Do you put yourself in the role of the compassionate father who is longing for their son to come home? Do you identify with the older brother who feels frustrated because he thinks his hard work has gone unnoticed? Or does the idea of the prodigal uh, resonate with you? Have you essentially told God to ah off at some point and now feel that you have wandered too far off and are ashamed to come back? Background for those of you who relate to the prodigal, who by asking for his inheritance early practically is telling his father, I can't wait for you to die. Get out of my life. I know better. There is good news for those of us who regret their Psalm 14.1 attitude. For those of us who have recognized that we should not uh, have been the fool who says in their heart, there is no God and I can do as I please. God tells us we can always, always, look at your neighbor and say always, always 
come home to him. That God, the Father, awaits with joy and celebration, a standing ovation and a jolly laugh, not a slow clap or a fake smile. So I'm going to close with the, re- with the reading of the story, encouraging you to ask yourself where you fit in this parable of the loving father with two sons. Verse 11. Then Jesus said there was a man who had two sons. The younger of them uh, said to his father, or Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. And so he divided his property between them. And a few days later, the young son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country. And there he squandered his property in uh, desolate living. And when he had spent everything, a a severe famine took took place throughout that country. And he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to the citizens of the country, who were sent sent him to feed uh, fields to feed in the pigs. This was not great because that unclean and all that. And he would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pe- pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he had come to himself, he said, "How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and and to spare? But here I am, dying of hungry hunger." I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired hands. And so he set off and went to his father. But while he was still a far way off, which means his dad is like staring out the window. Is he coming back? Is he coming back? Well, he's far away off. His father saw him, was filled with compassion, and ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, put... uh, Bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. And now get in the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For the son of mine was dead and he is alive again. And he is lost, but now he is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his elder son was in the field and when he had come and a Approached the house, he heard music and dancing. See, likes to party. And he called one of the slaves and asked them what was going on. And he replied, Your brother has come home, and your father has killed and fattened the calf because he has come back safe and sound. And then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him, but he answered his father, Listen. For all these years, I have been working like a slave for you, and I have never disobeyed your command, yet you have never given me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when the son of yours came back, but when the son of yours came back, when your child, (laughs) right? That person where you're just like, you're the mom, and you're like, your son. Da, da, da. Like, that's the vibe here, right? Your, your son, not my brother. When your son came back, um, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you have killed and fattened the calf for him. And then the father said to him, son, you are always with me. And all that, I, that is mine is yours. But we have to celebrate and rejoice because the brother of yours was dead and has come to life and he was lost. But now he has been found. He was lost, but now that he has been found. She was lost, but now he has been found. He was lost, but now he has been found. We were lost, but we have been found. A gospel without joy is no gospel. It is not good news. So today, let us hoop and holler to the best of our ability. I know that. Hoop and holler and and let that toothy radial smile and twinkle in your eye light up your face. Don't try to rein in this excitement. 
For what a celebration it is that what was once lost has now been found. Each of us at one point has been lost in some way, and we have been found by our Savior. That is good news. When you walk out here today, I hope you can, like, put back your shoulders, put a smile. You have been found. You have been found. The Lord Christ who reigns and is the King of kings, the Lord of lords, he has found you and invited you to spend time with him. May you realize again that that is so amazing, radically good news. Amen? Will you please pray with me? God, I uh, thank you that you have found us. That you focus on the founding, and you focus on the celebration, and you focus on the healing, and you focus on the, uh, the faithfulness. May we live into that identity today, and may we invite others into that special place of foundness. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.